Hello, this is John Soucy, and I'm your moderator again for another incredible interview that we have lined up today. On the line is our interviewer, Tim Mai, the CEO of DoDeals.com, and our guest speaker, Chris Iman from Phoenix, Arizona. Chris is definitely one of the most successful real estate investors in Phoenix, Arizona today, doing an average of five houses per day, which one of which he buys for his own business and four uh, he does for other investors, and they are actually buying 100 to 140 houses a month, and they're bidding on houses in four different counties in Arizona. They're making an average profit per deal for other investors of about $2,500 per deal, and for their own business, they're wholesaling uh, about four to 5000 for every house. Uh, we are going to, uh, as usual, we're going to grill Chris on every part of his business. We want to know about his market, his business model, and how he finds the deals, how he funds the deals, how he finds his buyers, how he closes and gets paid, and what's most important to a lot of people that are listening to these calls is what would Chris do if he had a 30-day action plan, if he had to start all over again with none of the current resources that he has? So I am really excited about this interview, and let's get started, shall we? Tim and Chris, are you there? Yes. Yep. Well, I'm here. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And Chris, thank you so much, buddy, for uh, for your willingness to be on this interview and, and your flexibility with the schedule and everything. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited about this interview. I'm excited to uh, learn a lot of stuff from you. Well, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Yeah, right. so we'll... Yeah, so we can start with, uh, Chris, if you can share with everybody a little bit about your background, how you got started, in, well, actually, your background even before you got started in real estate investing. Um, I'm a, I'm an Arizona native here in Phoenix, which is, you know, kind of rare. Most people transplant here, but uh, went to high school here, went to college here, played uh, played basketball in both locations. Um Got into the IT world for 10 years, worked myself up to a vice president of IT for a uh, to a smaller company, did some consulting for companies like Phillips Petroleum, um, and then when the uh, whole IT crash happened, got laid off a couple times, then ran out and got my real estate license and figured, uh, you know, took a buyer around for three or four weeks and showed them houses you know, every day on Saturday and Sunday until I got a call that said they found a house through another realtor mm. and uh, I was out of a commission. Um, I then got a listing and sold it in a couple weeks and uh, got paid on that transaction. And so uh, I, I like the idea of getting listings. Um, but I didn't want to go out and do uh, realtor presentations and that, so I decided uh in 1999, I was going to go down to trustee sales and buy my own properties to create my own listings. And I guess that's kind of how I got started in the real estate business. Oh, wow. That's an interesting start. Okay. And that, that has been since 1999, you're saying? Yeah. I bought my first house in December of 99. Wow. Okay. So you've been in the business for a long time, and, and I'm sh you've seen the ups and downs of the business as well. Um, how, I mean, how did how did the the market crash affect you? Or did it any, or did you sort of were you able to foresee some of that and plan for some of that? Well, um, you know, I planned personally on my own on my own level. Give you just a little bit more background. When I when I bought my first house, um, I bought it and sold it, and then I went and bought three more and bought them and sold it. And, you know, this is when the Phoenix market was you know pretty strong. And, uh, you know, I was, like I said, I was, I was consulting for Phillips Petroleum, and they were paying me 100 bucks an hour to consult for them. After my sixth deal, um, I quit at Phillips Petroleum, and all my friends thought I was crazy. Um, but I was just doing better in the real estate market. Um, and probably within six months of me buying and selling and people watching me, um, calling me up, knocking on my door, saying, hey, I want to try this, I want to try this. And, you know, probably at the end of six months, every as many as I could buy, I had friends and friends of friends and friends of friends saying, hey, I want to buy one, I want to buy one. So, I mean, I was I was just 
buying one, pick up the phone, calling people, um, out and wholesaling them off, which we call locally wholesalers. I mean, a thousand here, three thousand there, two thousand there, and I was able to get rid of as many of the houses that I was buying um, at that speed. Um, well, then I found out there there was an ability because not everybody could pay cash for these to finance them and to become a hard money lender. So I, uh, I was able to get some private equity guys to jump in with me, um, about $25 million of private equity money. Um, and then I, uh, in 2005, I acquired a $100 million line from Wells Fargo. Um, so to say um, how I did on the crash of 2007, in 2006, I liquidated all my own personal assets um, as far as rentals. I knew the market was coming down, so I liquidated all of them. Wow, but that's smart. I was also part of a hard money company that had $80 million on the street when Ooh. it flipped upside down. And when houses go from 250 to 50, I don't care how far you plan in advance, <laughs> bad deal. Right. So, um, so, your also, hard mon- so your hard money lending company was affected by by the 2007 crash, and um, and I, I assume you ended up taking a lot of those properties back and just sold them at a loss, or what? Yeah, we uh, recovered 44 million dollars of the 80 million dollar portfolio and just liquidated them through. I mean, we were doing short sales. We were doing. You know, recovering them, rehabbing them, selling them, wholesaling them, just however we could, you know, through our different networks that we developed, you know, when we got on the on the ramp up, we used those same networks on the on the ramp down to to liquidate the assets and you know, I uh I mean like I personally got, you know, hit pretty hard because uh, you know, my money was all in the company, so Right. And and what about um, the hundred thousand hundred million dollar uh, lines of credit loan from Wells Fargo? Did they cut that too, or did, did were you able to still hold on to that? No, once our uh, once our uh, I guess our our balances got out of whack, meaning we needed to have about ten percent of our money in each loan, and they would have ninety percent of their money in each loan. Well, <laughs> as the prices were decreasing, um, and you know, when you recover assets, they they take those off your books. You know, our uh, our leverage numbers got out of whack, and uh, they shut down our line and basically, you know, took over our company, and we just started liquidating. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so that's so okay. So you know, you went through that, and 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 you you have recovered from that apparently. So, yeah, share with us what, what happened now, <laughs> what's going on now. Well, and, you know, when that, so in 2007, you know, when basically the financing went away, you know, I uh, I started in the foreclosure business, and obviously the foreclosure business was the business that was growing. So um, as we were winding down our finance company, um, and you know there wasn't a our, our foreclosure business was a small portion of our business because uh, you know in the Phoenix market it was booming like a lot of other places and there wasn't a ton of foreclosures when you can put your house on the market and get five offers in two hours you know right. most people don't go to foreclosure in that time so our, our foreclosure business was a very small part of our business but you know with the number of uh, loans going into default we knew it would uh, become a very big part of our business. Um, the problem was 2007 and early 2008, as it's declining, um, there wasn't a huge business model there because nobody was ready to jump in. They're still seeing it chug down, chug down, and so the investors weren't ready to jump in just yet. seems like it was about March or April of 2008 where people like started looking at it like the prices started to get really attractive for you know what was going to sale. Gotcha. Okay. And so, 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 do you? I mean, do you only focus on foreclosures now and, and buying at the auction, or is there any other um, uh, strategies that you that you do? 
Uh, no, we buy we buy wherever we can find a deal. Um, you know, at first it was just foreclosure auctions. Um, it started in uh, 2008, um, but the short sale market and the REO market hadn't quite been completely developed yet. You know, the banks were still just you know taking them back by the hundreds, actually by the thousands, um, and they hadn't really developed the short sale market. And uh, you know, and the uh, com- the systems that they have in place now. Now, um, we but we buy REOs and short sales and foreclosures. We'll buy anywhere we can find a deal that makes sense for our investors or for us. Um, it's just back in 2008, they just hadn't developed the systems in place that they have now that we can you can actually borrow buy REOs and buy short sales and you know get stuff approved and actually. Get to somebody that you can actually buy something from. Right. Okay. And yeah. And 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 um, it seems like you've always favor wholesaling over you know owning and rehabbing and stuff. Is there a reason for that, or you just like doing big bar, just like turning a big volume of deals and not not focusing too much on on making more money per deal, or what? what what's your reason behind just doing? quick flips like that well when i first started getting in the market um the thing that made me more attractive than a lot of other people is i wouldn't i wouldn't cut up the, the really nice ones for myself um i would i would give everybody an equal opportunity of the one that was going to make you know semi good money and the one that might be a home run um and that's why I kept getting customers returning and returning because I wasn't carving out the the really good ones for myself. I was giving everybody an opportunity to to have, you know, the nice stucco tile, clean, move in ready house along with the nineteen sixty house that needed twenty thousand in rehab. Um and I think that's why my business kept growing and growing as a wholesaler. So um I didn't want to cannibalize my customers, so I just keep sending everything out and have, and have stuck with that practice sense. Gotcha. Okay, that's awesome. And um, well, what is your you know the, the market that you're in? What's the current market condition now? I mean, you know, how, are you seeing a lot of foreclosures? Are you, what, what, what's going on now? Well, obviously, the Phoenix market is one of the biggest markets, and the numbers are still up. We see. An average day has a thousand houses scheduled um, every day. Um, wow. Out of that, we probably end up with about 400 that have opening bids that are scheduled for sale. Um, so, I mean, the volume is is still there. Um, market conditions, you know, that tax credit uh, definitely created a uh, an increase in the ability to buy a trustee sale, and for mm-hmm. the retailer who buys from me to retail out um, mm-hmm. we were probably averaging 12 to 15,000 sales a month in you know March April May um, but we're significantly off that I'd say we're you know six to seven thousand sales a month uh, with the tax credit going away and um, there's probably been another 30 percent increase we've moved from about 30,000 active to about 40,000 actives on our current MLS market so it's definitely kind of slowed down the uh, the volume, and it's kind of made the market a little bit softer right now. Okay, okay, that's uh, definitely definitely good to uh, get get to know that. And I mean, do, do you see that the Phoenix market is, has pretty much uh, flattened out now, or do you, I mean, do you see any signs of it going to continue to go down, more down in value or coming well, back in <laughs> With the increase in the uh, inventory on MLS, like I said, we we went from thirty to forty thousand, and the experts say thirty thousand is like a, a level market, not a buyer's market, not a seller's market. So, with the forty thousand actives that we have, it's more of a buyer's market, which will obviously soften prices. Um, and uh, you know, we have the fall, the holidays coming up, so I would I would expect to see a little bit of a dip here in the next three to four months um, waiting for the January and slash spring market, which is always the busiest here in Phoenix. 
Gotcha. So how would that affect the way you buy at the auction? Um, when I'm buying from my own account, I'm, you know, I'm typically buying it, trying to buy at like 68%. So if it's worth a hundred, I'm trying to buy at 68,000. Um, because of the holding times I would expect with the, you know, the fall market and the holidays coming up and everything, I'd probably move that number back to about 64% just because of possible holding time and, you know, carrying costs. Gotcha. Okay. And all right. So, so let, let's talk a little bit about your, um, your, your business model. Do you still have a hard money lending company in house or, or are you just doing wholesaling now? No, we, uh, we're currently doing hard money. We're just we're back to just private um, individuals who want to get you know a high percentage return for their money as opposed to sticking it in a one or two percent account. Um, we're we're paying investors between twelve and fourteen percent. Um, our hard money rates here locally are eighteen percent. So um, you know we're just making the margin and helping those investors get in um, into these loans. We okay. Take- so, all right. So let me let me see if I I, I understand um, the model correctly. So, on 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 the real estate side, you're you're buying these properties, you're wholesaling them, you're also you're providing a service where you help other investors buy these properties, and then on the financing side, you're borrowing money from private lenders, and 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 being the hard money um, uh, lender to service those loans and loaning these out uh, to these uh, investor buyers of yours. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And so and that's a good point there, um, Tim. Is, uh, Chris, so when you're, doing, when you're talking about wholesaling, you're actually going in and closing on every one of these deals. You're buying them. You're not just – uh, doing any kind of assignments or, or double closings necessarily, or do you do a little bit of that as well? Um, well, it's it's kind of a hybrid. I mean, when we buy a trustee sale, we have to pay for it by 5 p.m. the next business day. So on that, on those acquisitions, we buy and we acquire. Um, okay. On the REOs and short sales, I typically, um, you know, I'll acquire them and I'll get a like a hard approval, like yes, this is this is a done deal. We want a five thousand dollar earnest deposit and put it in title. But I have so many people like, hey, I want another deal, I want another deal. I usually have that. Let's just say that's on a thirty day escrow. I usually have that sold during that thirty days, and so I uh, I'll acquire that house. I throw my money into title. I'll then double close it, have them put their money in the title, and I get my money back the next day. Okay, great. Gotcha. Now. Uh, what what is the percentage of the properties you're buying are at the auction, and what's the other percentage of REOs and short sales? I say it, it's probably fifty fifty. Um, it's probably by fifty percent of trustee sale, fifty percent at you know other arenas or other areas. Gotcha. Okay. And all right. Um, and, and so. So, um, so do you, do you have a big team that's helping you um, in in doing this business? Do you have partners? What's going on? Um, we have one partner, um, and then I have three drivers to look at houses. Um, I have three people working in the office to, you know, work through the trustee sales every day. You know, call, get opening bids, uh, put together our uh, what we call an equity list, or um, you know, the top say 100 houses that are going to sale the next day that we send out to our investors. Um, so there's probably 10 of us all together. Okay. And what what is it that you do in the business? Uh, my responsibility is uh, I, I manage all the hard money. I work with all our local investors who are, you know, trying to place their money at that 12 to 14%. Um, I run all the out-of-county areas. Um, which is Pima County, Pinal County, and Yavapai County, which consists of smaller surrounding cities in the Phoenix area. I deal with all the new investors. Um, I also teach local foreclosure classes at um, title companies to help people understand 
a lot of people want to get in the business, but they don't understand the business. Um, so what I've learned is if you can, you know, put 50 people in a room and get them comfortable with the process and and make them understand that it's just not a bunch of sharks working in this business, that um, that's the best way to convert someone that doesn't know about it into their into your customer. Mm, okay, that's a great uh, strategy to find customers for sure. That's good. Okay, and um, all right, and then and and so you mentioned you have one partner. What and what does uh, what does your partner do? Uh, he strictly just manages the Phoenix foreclosure market. Um, like I said, we have two in- two assistants in house. One puts together the daily list and sends it to our investors. And then the other one takes in all the in, takes in all the bids from our investors, and we can end up with as many or as little as like 15, as many as like 40 in a day. Um, they take those bids in on the properties. They run title on them. Um, they check taxes on them, um, and then you know we they funnel into Tim, who basically manages. Um, we have two bidders, himself. Uh, his wife, and then we have an, another bidder, and he just manages all that process. Gotcha. Okay. Do Do you have like a certain? Um, how do you guys manage all of these deals and these leads? Do you have a, a certain uh, software system you use, or you just use a spreadsheet? Uh, what What is the you know, I guess the systems part of your business look like? Um, we just send out our our daily list as a spreadsheet. That way. Most people have, you know, Excel or or some spreadsheet software that they can open it. Um, and then we just uh, – all our bids come in through our website. Um, and then, you know, my assistant, you know, takes the bids and sends them into title or runs, you know, title searches on all of them. But that's basically just spreadsheets and um, our website is where most of, most, most of the stuff happens. Gotcha. Okay, good to know. Now, the, um, you know, we, um, we we mentioned in in the intro how many deals uh, you do per month. But if you can just uh, sort of repeat that and 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 walk us through, you know, um, yeah, walk us through that a little bit. How 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 many deals are you doing currently doing per month on average? Uh, anywhere from 100 to 140. 100 to 140. And do you see that number? Increasing, um, you know, toward the end of this year here, or would you see in, any slowdown in that, or what, what are you seeing? Um, I don't know. I would, I would say we we're probably gonna we're probably gonna be. That's a pretty steady number. I mean, we're one of the larger companies here locally. Um, you know, we're we're getting, you know. As always, when everybody sees a lot of other people successful in a business, they're trying to, you know, imitate the model, um, right. you know, slash the pricing. So there's a little bit of, little bit of downward pressure for people that haven't been in this business for 10 years and are now trying to jump in this business because, you know, there's just very few ways out there to really make money right now. Um, so it seems like there's a, a lot of people jumping in. Um, and like I said, they're they're slashing their prices, saying, you know, we'll do it for cheaper. Um, mm-hmm. We're able to keep our customer base just because uh, a lot of our customers are longtime customers. You know, they were buying in 2003 and four, um, mm-hmm. and you know they they went away during the 2007 years, but they're back again. And you know they understand that if you buy low and fix it up and sell it, you know, there's money to be made there. Gotcha. Okay. Then what is your um, uh, what is your average profit per deal uh, when when you're buying these? Well, on our bid service, we charge a charge a flat twenty five hundred dollar fee. So if you're our customer and we send out our equity list and you know you like this one property because it's opening up at you know a hundred thousand dollars, but you think it's worth two hundred thousand. Um, most stuff is selling right at about 70% right now. So you might send in a bid and say, hey, it's open at 100. I pay 135. Um, if we acquire that house for you, we charge a flat $2,500 fee. Um, and then, you know, we acquire the house. We get it uh, titled in your name. If you need hard money, we call up the lender, get 
the hard money set up, um, and then close the transaction the next day, $2,500. If we acquire it, you know, let's just say the same same $200,000 house, and let's just say I, I'm bidding on it for myself, and I acquire it, you know, at 136 I might throw it out of my website, you know, at 140 and just try to wholesale it out to, to somebody that doesn't want to work in the fast-paced um, foreclosure market. And that's probably the right. difference in the two customers. The people that buy from me wholesale, they like to know that, because I usually, as soon as I buy, call one of my drivers and have the locks changed. Mm-hmm. And there's just certain people that like to work at that pace. Okay, Chris sent it out. He's already bought it. You know, they can go look, open the front door, walk through it, versus guys that want to get out there. And, you know, they may not be able to get in. They're peeking through the windows. Um, right. They're 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 willing to take a little bit more risk, but they know their their flat fee is 2500 and they're not going to get marked up, you know, five or six right. grand. Right, I see. Okay. And and you mentioned that majority of your investors, they buy, they fix it up and sell it retail. Is that correct? Your buyers? Yeah, most of my clients are retailers. Okay. And, and what kind of um, profit are they making, do you know, on, on the retail end? You know, it just, it just varies on, you know, um, the buyer. Some buyers... You know, no certain areas. So there's certain area towns, certain areas of town that are maybe a little older, or you know, they know the market better, and they're they're buying it, you know, 140 and selling it 200. And you know, because they know the area real well, they're making really, you know, good money. Whereas others are just playing um, the the three bed, two bath stucco tile game, where there's you know, a thousand houses in that subdivision, and there's ten sold just like it in the last three months. And um, but when you get into that game, um, it gets more competitive because it's less risky. You know exactly pretty much what it's going to sell for within five thousand dollars. And you know people are, and the rehab may only be you know three or four thousand dollars because it's a two thousand four built house. Um, you start getting into that market, and it gets more competitive because it's easier to figure out. Right. Okay. And so, what um, you know, you, what is your 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 average price range uh, of homes you're you're looking for when you're buying when you're buying? Um, it sounds like your purchase price is around 100 to 150. Is that correct? I we I mean when I'm buying for myself, I mean I I'm I'm gonna I'm, I've got a deal right now that was a purchase that. 832 that's selling on the back end for a million. Um, you know, uh, granted, those don't happen all the time, so there's less of those. But I don't, I don't care what price range it is. I'll, I'll work any market to make, to make money. Uh, okay. But I feel well, now, 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 Chris, when you say you'll you'll work any market, does that mean that you've actually built up uh, a list of clients and, and buyers that will essentially? that you know you could sell to at pretty much any price range? Yeah. Well, I, I because I've been in this business for 11 years, uh, my website has roughly around 30,000 uh, investors in it. So, like, when I buy a house and I go to send it out to wholesale, it's getting, it's getting delivered to 30,000 people. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll bid on the $50,000 house. I'll bid on the $500,000 house. It's just all based on the margin. Like I said, and I'm a local native here, so I know what subdivision people like, and I know where I know areas that people, you know, like a lot less. So. Right. Okay. It's definitely good to know. And what is the median home price in, in your area? Do you know? Um, I'd say it's with the decrease in pricing. I would say it's. Probably around one hundred twenty thousand. Okay, that's pretty low. <laughs> must must have been a huge drop. What what was yeah. it used to be before? What was it? I think uh, it was uh, I think it was about two eighteen. So that's about a hundred thousand dollar decrease. I mean, wow. to, give you an, to give you an example, I mean everybody has seen the new Cardinal Stadium that they just finished building. Um, anybody watches football anyway. Um, and that's right out along a major freeway. 
Um, towns out there consist of, you know, part of Phoenix, Avondale, um, Goodyear, Tolson. But an average Av- Avondale house that was maybe 2,000 square feet used to sell for 250. You can buy a lot of if you're buying a trustee sales, you can buy a lot of those for 70 or 80, and they may retail at 120. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. All right, and so you you share with us you 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 try to buy properties uh, any way you can. What what are your top three ways of buying properties? Apparently, one of them is uh, is at the auction at the trustee sale. What's the other two? Um, just REO and short sale. Um, now, when when you're saying REO and short sales, do you have realtors that are bringing you deals, or are you actively going out there on the MLS looking for these deals? No. Um, once again, I'm just relying on the network that I've developed and the relationships I've developed over the years. Um, on the short sale, typically I'm looking for the agent that uh, finally got a short sale approval after working it for you know, 60 or 90 days and their buyer is gone and they call mm-hmm. me up and say, Hey Chris, look at this deal. I, it's a, it's a steal at this price. And my buyer that was originally put the contract is, isn't there anymore. And I'll look at the deal and I'm like, yeah, that's a deal. I'll buy it. And we just do a quick switch out because, you know, they can't, you can't assign those contracts. So you just do a, a quick switch out with the bank um, and just say, Hey, this guy's paying cash. And you know, I, I acquire a lot that way, but I'm not out there advertising it. It's just, you know, just people call me up and say, hey, will you buy this? Will you buy this? And then um, the same with REOs. I have a lot of REO agents that, you know, just say, hey, look at this one. It just, it's, I'm listed tomorrow. What do you think of it? And I'm, I'm like, yeah, that looks like a pretty good deal. Um, I'll give you a full price cash offer on it. Um, and I just think agents in general would, rather deal with a cash buyer than some conventional buyer that's going to do an appraisal and, you know, and have, have the opportunity to, to fall, have the deal fall apart. Gotcha. So, so your advantage, your competitive edge uh, sort of uh, in your market is that you have been in the market for so long, you know, everybody knows you. And so, so you pretty much just have people bringing you deals. You don't have to go out there and hunting for deals anymore. Is that correct? Yeah, and, uh, you know, yeah, I, I have people bringing me deals. And I have, you know, agents that I've, I've known, you know, for a while that know that I'm a cash buyer, that if the deal's right, and most of these agents are smart enough to figure out if the deal's right or not right, um, and they find the deal, they know, hey, send it to Chris because he'll close cash, he'll close quickly, I'll get paid faster. So. Right. So do you do you spend any money in marketing at all for anything? Um, yeah, I mean I uh, I advertise in the local um, the local real estate school, which is the largest real estate school here in the valley. I advertise in that because uh, you know every every new agent that goes generally goes through this one big school. So you know once you go through that school, you become you get that publication for free. So. I uh, advertise in that. Plus, I advertise in it just to do branding, just for people not to forget about me. But um, other than that, I don't I don't do much advertising. What, what, what does your ad say in in that publication? I uh, just list you know our different wholesale properties, bid service, hard money, um, just our three major core businesses. Gotcha. Okay. And I mean. So- so when you advertise that uh, to these realtors, um, what what you know what kind of response are you expecting from that? Because because it sounds like the kind of advertising would be more um, more appropriate for real estate investors and not necessarily realtors. Am I did I miss something? <laughs> no. What's funny is um, I know real estate investors. There's no publication out there that, in, at least in our area, that just focuses on the real estate investor. Um, mm-hmm. But if you get to the agents, the agents will, the agents will say, if they get an investor or the investor goes to an agent, they go, oh, mm-hmm. look at this company over here. And what I try to, when I, when I teach the classes at uh, the different local title companies, um, I try to stress to the agents, 
we should be partners. You get the investor, you bring them to me, um, and then if you're if you're looking for a bid service model to acquire houses for your investor, um, we can we'll make a partnership. And I give them a small referral fee on every on every deal, but I'm really trying to focus on, you know, do you really want to you know beat the street for listings, or if you got an investor, bring them to me, I'll acquire houses for them, and then you can be listing them on the back end. And getting your your commission, so you know, ring okay. on. I'm sorry. Go so ahead. I just, I just, uh, I just, like I said, every every one of these, uh, every time I can get into, you know, I do luncheons at real estate companies. I do, um, I do classes at the title companies. But really, I'm just trying to get the real estate agent to know that I'm out there, and then when they find the investor through their own social network or whatever they say, well, we know about this guy that can get you at the courthouse and and then we just kind of, I make a deal with the, the agent and say, hey, you bring it to me, then you'll have this steady stream of listings. As he buys from me, he'll rehab them, he'll give them to you to list them. That's good. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, that's an awesome uh, strategy for sure. Um, and, and, I, and I could totally see how that's I mean that can be applicable in just about any market. You know, getting the realtors to to work with you and and bring you their their investor buyers because I'm I'm here in the, in the Houston Texas market and um, a lot of buyers are buying from the MOS. You know, the Har Houston Association of Realtors just reported this past month 25% of the home sales were sold to investors on the MOS. And so, so yeah, so a lot of agents are, are working with investors now, and you know, by by educating the realtors to um, to to bring those investors to you is definitely a uh, a really smart way to go about it. Now, are there any type of properties that you you type of deals that you stay away from? Um, no, I mean, if it's a if it's a bid service, you know. I'm I'm bidding for somebody else, so there is no real risk on it. As a matter of fact, uh, today I'm bidding on a mobile home for an investor, um, which isn't something that I would acquire from my own account. But the price is going to be so is is going to end up being between five and seven thousand dollars, and he's going to acquire it and stick somebody in there and rent it, and that's his model. Um, but you know, as far as the bid service, we bid on all kinds of stuff. On my on my wholesale stuff, I try to stick to to better areas, newer product. Um, obviously, in the inner city stuff, it's older product, but there are certain areas where I know that hey, people love that area. Versus, you know, you go three miles this way, and people don't really like that area. But I just uh, it's all it's all price point, percentage of what I can acquire it for, and how much rehab it needs. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And most of them are all single family homes, but you don't like um get into multifamily or, or commercial or anything, do you? Um I don't really buy much multifamily for myself, although my bid I have plenty of bid service clients that buy multifamily. Oh, We're gotcha. acquiring uh, you know, four plexes for sixty, seventy thousand. Wow. Um, that <laughs> That probably bring in five hundred dollars a door, so they're buying at sixty or seventy and getting two thousand dollars a month rent. So we have a lot of clients that bid on that, and then the big multi units, especially in the B and C areas, are only bringing ten thousand to twelve thousand a door. So I I bought a sixty unit for a guy for about seven twenty, um, and once again probably being bringing in about four fifty a door. Now, vacancy rates are high because there's so many investors buying houses, and a lot of the people that could only afford to rent an apartment are are able to rent, you know, an older single-family home or something. But, I mean, at $12,000 a door, um, that's pretty cheap. It costs a lot more than that to build it. Gotcha. And, I mean, it sounds like you're also buying all over – uh, all over towns. Is there any any specific area that you stay away from? Anything? Do you end up buying any property? Are, are there any war zones in your area? Do you, do you buy any in the lo- really low end um, properties? 
Um, I have a lot of buyers that buy in the, the low end property just because they're acquiring them for, you know, twenty and twenty five thousand dollars and then they mm-hmm. cash flow really well. But I'm I don't I don't buy um in some of those areas for my own account. Like I said, I try to stick to newer products or nicer areas. Um and then, you know, as far as the the smaller towns like the Tucson's, um, Flagstaff and Prescott's some of those areas, you know, we we buy for our own account and do a bid service there. What we like about those counties is um, everybody wants to, you know, bid in Phoenix because, you know, it's easy to understand. Um, but because I'm a native, once again, I've I've been to all these cities a lot of times. So, um, and I've created networks with local real estate agents in those cities, and I rely on their values. And they say, hey, this this is a great area. You should buy this one. And um, once again, I acquire it. I'll get them the three percent listing, and they sell it for me. And I just create relationships in those smaller towns. Um, but what's nice is very few people bidding, so better margins. Gotcha. Okay. And what about boat dogs? Do you have I mean, besides realtors bringing you deals? Do you have other real estate investors, wholesalers that that you sort of like boat dog that bring you deals as well? Um, I, uh, because I have, like I said, such a large database of investors, um, I end up selling a small percentage of my bid service clients, you know, they'll acquire a house, um, and they'll say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'd like to just quick flip this one. So I'll get uh, the bid service fee, especially if they get a decent deal. Um, and they may, I mean, they might've got a pretty good deal and want to mark it up 10 grand and I'll send it out on my website and sell it for them in 24 hours. And they're in out of deal and you know I small I charge a small fee for doing that but that just helps pay for advertising dollars to keep the new investors subscribing to the website so gotcha okay well that's good so um, so so let's move on to the funding part of your business Do, are you constantly you know you mentioned you use private money to uh, you use up uh, um, private lenders to to for your hot made lending company uh, do you use your own deals your own money on your own deals or you also use private money on your own deals as, as well um no i uh i have a i have a source of capital that is uh um there there are two guys that uh have the twenty five million in my uh, hard money company back in o two and o three before I got my wells Fargo line. I basically have a kind of an unlimited checkbook for my deals. Um, I just say, hey, I got this one. Um, it's not typically hard money. They pay for it, and I just give them a percentage split of the deal. Um, but uh, but that, that, that's pretty cool. Do you mind sharing, like, around what, what percentage that is? Or? Uh, I give them 50% of the deal, but... Um, you know, they make money on it, I make money on it, and I don't have to put any money down. When my hard money company went down, I I had every dollar in there, so I I got completely wiped out. I mean, I went from um, living a really nice lifestyle to um, basically broke in, in a very short time frame. Gotcha. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know, Sorry to hear about that, and I'm so glad that you know you have, you know, instead of uh, going hiding somewhere in a shell somewhere, you you actually bounce back and and now kicking some serious butt. And so, you know, congratulations for that for sure. Definitely a testament to to uh, staying staying on track and uh, you know being diligent about your business. Well, I mean, it would have done me no good to go uh, hide somewhere. Um, you know, just. Uh, you just, I mean, there were some long days and some sleepless nights, but, you know, you just you just keep plugging away. I don't know. Well, yeah, or the alternative, the alternative for some people could be, well, I'm just going to go apply for a job somewhere and, you know, and, and not worry about having to lose everything again, right? Um, I, yeah, I, that's not a mentality that just, it just, it doesn't click with me. Um, <laughs> after right. seeing the kind of money that is made in the real estate market, and um, you know, to me, it's just the art of the deal. I don't, I don't really care if I make five hundred dollars or four thousand dollars. 
I, I'll be doing this business 10 years from now because I want to acquire that house today and be like, okay, who can I sell it to? You know, get, you know, get the contract locked up, get, you know, the earnest deposit in, especially on a wholesale deal. Most of my wholesale transactions are in 24 to 48 hours and then just go to the next one and go to the next one and go to the next one. So, um, it's not really the money. It's more of the art of the deal. And when, when I wasn't making deals, it was no fun. Now I'm back making deals and I'll work seven days a week. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, um, knowing that th- what 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 um, you know what affected you was the hard money lending side. Um, I mean, are, are are you still would you still get as much involved in the hard money lending side as you did before, uh, or would you you know, or would you do a lot less of that so that way if it ever happened again, if the, you know the like let's say the market's gonna come back and then there'll be another crash. I guess the next time around, you would know, uh, you would plan it ahead of time so that you don't have so much money out um, before the market crash. Or what, what are you? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm just, uh, you know, right now I love. I'm back doing the hard money because I think it's a good deal. But look, if you look at the pricing, you know, they're buying, you're buying two thousand built stucco tile homes for. 2,000 square feet for, you know, call that $80,000. I mean, that's $40 ah. a foot. A builder can't wow. build it for $40 a foot. And let's right. just say they'd buy it at $40 $40 a foot, so $80,000. i am making all my borrowers put 25% in the deal. Um, so mm, if they bought right. it for $80, they are sticking in $20. i am only giving them $60. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to brace myself just in case there is a double dip that people are talking about and it drops mm-hmm. 10 to 15 percent mm-hmm. um what i did what i did notice is when houses were down at the 30 dollar a foot range and 32 dollar and 34 dollar a foot range there were tons of investors willing to buy them so um i'm gonna i'm gonna play the hard money game um and i'm just i think i've learned from the the tech stock run-up and and now the housing run-up that <laughs> if everybody's doing it Maybe it's time to get out of it. <laughs> no kidding, right? <laughs> All right. Um, and let me see here. So, so you, uh, I, I take it you don't have any more line to, uh, business line to credit then? No, I'm just dealing with, uh, you know, personal private guys that have uh, that have known me in the business for a long time, and uh, they have the money put away. And they just don't want to let it sit there at one and two percent. But they're not. A lot of people aren't, you know, overly enthusiastic about the stock market. Um, And you know, in the bond market, they're not getting, you know, a lot of money. So, you know, they realize my model that I'm buying wholesale, that I'm making them put 25 percent into the deal, and then we're sticking our money in. Right. Um, So, uh, you know, and since. uh, since about, I guess I'm probably doing, call it a loan or two a day um, on these houses. Everybody else is paying cash, but um, we haven't had a default in, you know, probably 36 months. So, um, you know, probably in, I guess, early 08 or late 07, you know, after after everything came tumbling down, you know, and we started to put these large deposits down 25 percent we've been pretty successful everybody's paying on time and right do you think that's the key that was the that was the difference to the point where where you're not getting the defaults anymore is because your investors actually have more more of their own money invested um that was a that's a big portion of it but i mean no one could i mean if i could have foreseen the 07 crash i obviously would have gotten out way before it happened um, but I, don't, I mean, no one. I don't. No one saw that coming. I'm sure some people did, but you know, most people didn't see it coming. Well, in some um, markets, more than another, right? Yeah. Phoenix, oh, I think, yeah. got, your got hit so much harder. Yeah, Phoenix got hit hard just because of the, let's call it a, uh, you know, 80% run up in the last in a two-year time frame. Right. Um, whereas you guys in the Houston market probably didn't see the big, huge increase. So you didn't see the big huge decrease, right? Sure. 
Okay, and um, so you're still actively looking for private lenders, though. Private, is that correct? Yeah, we we have about uh, uh, seven to ten million dollars out right now at any given time, and it stays out full time. Every investor I have that has money, it's staying out. I mean, if they get a payoff, they say, "Hey, Chris, I got money to relend." It goes out the next day. I have. I'm still having to refer um, hard money business out to some of my other friends that are in the hard money business. Um, but I, I, I do all the arrangements for our customers, whether it's my hard money deal and my hard money loan or theirs, because I want the customer to come back to me next time. So I get the option. Is it, is it our money going out or is it somebody else's money going out? Right. What, what would you say was the top, you know, top three ways um, that you found these private money, pri- private lenders? Um, it's just all, you know, I don't have a securities license, so I can't go out and advertise for people that want to put hard money loans together. Um, you know, so it's got to be people that come to you. Um, so, you know, when people get referred to me, I sit down and go through the program and say, it's hard money, this is what we're doing, you know, here's the model. And some people like it. I think most people like it, but and some people don't. And then I just I help them put together the loans. And uh, but so it's all got to be worth word of mouth because I don't have I don't have any, a securities license to go raise money. So. Okay, and then so when it's word of mouth, is it mostly realtors that are referring them to you, or other investors referring them to you, the title company? Do you have any um, specific it, sources? It, it's a, it's a mixture of them, and I don't usually get. Um, I've had I've had one come from a title company. I've had one come from a realtor. I had one come from one of the guys that was doing the loans, and he told his friends, "Hey, this is the best best way to park your money and get you know 12% return right now." Um, but you know, once once they come in the door, and usually typical guys that come in the door have a million plus to to get out there. You know, they're content to, and I think they're content to just sit there and keep it rolling until they find something that uh, gives them a better return. Um, right. With, and I consider it, you know, since we haven't had a default in, you know, three years, pretty little risk. Mm, that's good. Yeah, that's definitely a good, uh, good rate for sure. Okay. What about other hard money lenders in town? Are, are they all charging 25% down from uh, requiring 25% down from the buyers? Is that like um, standard now in your market area? 25 to 30 is standard. There are some doing if you there are some doing 15 if you've been a long time investor flipper here in the local market without you know any default. We kind of keep. We kind of keep abs on each other, meaning we're semi-friendly. So if if one particular borrower, you know, has ten houses and he starts late paying or um, you know not paying, you know, we're pretty good at saying, hey, be careful with this guy because uh, he he seems to be struggling. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, yeah, you know. I'm, I think 25 to 30 percent down is the right place to be because if there is a quote-unquote double dip, let's just say we drop 10 percent in this fall. I mean, if you got 25 percent down, then it dropped 10 percent, but they still had 15 percent of their own money in it. Plus, they probably put another 5 percent in rehab in it. So right. the chances of them giving your keys back are probably pretty slim. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, well let's um, let's move to the buyer side of the business. Um, you, you you mentioned earlier most of your buyers are are rehabbers, retail. Um, is is there any reason why you're not attracting more landlord buyers? Um, no, I have I actually have two funds that I bid for. One's a ten million dollar fund, and one's a twenty million dollar fund. They're all they're both private placement memorandum, so PPM. Um, and I, I acquire for both of those too. But they have they have certain models. They're 
2000 and newer, stucco tile, two-car garage, three-bed, two-bath, somewhere between 13 and 1,700 square feet. Um, but I, I, I acquire a bunch for them, too. I probably, you know, out of that four a day that's acquired for other groups, one or two a day is for those guys. I see. And what are they doing with them? They're just putting them in. Um, they put out these private placement memorandums that people invested in um, that have, you know, it, it's spelled out in the in the documents that we're going to buy, acquire in the Phoenix area. We're going to hold for five to seven years. Um, and uh, so they're just acquiring these stucco tile houses, you know, sticking them in, rehabbing them up, and leasing them out, waiting for, you know, a recovery of the market. Gotcha. Okay. That's uh that, that's good to know. And yeah, and, and um, um what is the percentage of your buyers use your hard money lending service versus, you know, them just buy using their own money, their own cash? Or their it's own probably service? forty to fifty percent use hard money versus the other, you know, fifty to sixty percent pay cash. And Chris, gotcha. are, are you are, with your re- newer requirements on your hard money loans? Do you find that potentially the newer investors that are coming in can't necessarily afford or, or don't have that much cash to put down for for these properties? Um, I I see. I have I run across that every now and then where they say, hey, you know, I only have probably fifteen percent down. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, this is not a, to me, I just kind of say, you know, what, are you sure you want to play this game then? Um, because I don't want a customer that wants to buy a house and try to get in this market, but only has $15,000 because I don't want to be the guy that, uh, you know, maybe he lost his job and he's taking his last bit of money to try to try to get this to work. Um, yeah. I want, I want to, I don't want to feel bad. I want customers that are liquid that have cash can afford to put the down payment put the rehab in um because i don't want to be the bad guy that forecloses on that home because he tried this one time he's out of cash he lost his job and now i'm like the bad guy that's foreclosing on it right gotcha okay and um are you currently actively advertising to find buyers you know i i know you mentioned about uh, uh, some, you spend some money with your website, get people uh, in, into your funnel. Um, I, I mean, how active are you in marketing to find buyers? Um, like I said, we do the we do the um, the ad in the the local realtor magazine, and then I probably teach a class a week to probably an average of fifty people. Um, then I probably do. You know, a meeting a day at a Starbucks, um, you know, of somebody that got referred to me from a title company or a real estate agent. And uh, so, I'm, I mean, I'm willing to spend my time with anybody for 30 minutes to an hour just to, you know, give them an opportunity to learn what I've learned. And I try to be an open book with them because, you know, if they trust you, they'll use you. If they don't, they won't. Right. That's good. Okay, and all right. And so, what what about what about um, when you have a property? Do you advertise your property anywhere? Or do you just send out your emails? I mean, do you even put them on Craigslist or put out signs to market no, I, the property? I, I just put them on my website. Um, I use a I use a you know constant contact that helps me track how many people forward my emails and. Uh, Especially if I get a really good property, I'll blast it out, and you can see that hey, it got forwarded from, you know, 20 of my clients to 20 of their friends, and then I'll go to my website and look. There's 15 new listings of people that want my email. Um, so I like to keep people, you know, coming to the site. I don't want them to find it on Craigslist or any of these other sources. I want them to come to my site and subscribe. So. Gotcha. Okay. Um, d- is there any in any time when you have I mean in any time when you like you know um, for whatever reason don't have a buyer for one of the properties that you have and then you do you tap into other 
other wholesalers buy, that they might have a buy for one of your properties? Do you work with any other investors in, you know, with um, that respect? I probably have three or four wholesalers that I've been, um, that I've been, you know, friends with for a while that, you know, take my inventory. Um, I don't, I kind of ask them not to send it out the first day, but if I don't have it sold the first day, you know, they might have that one buyer that's looking for that one property, um, to help me move it. Um, but that, and that happens, you know, not too frequently. I mean, because generally if most buyers in the market have, have found my website. So, um, gotcha. and then, you know, I'm not perfect at buying. I, I do my last, my last resort is to retail. Um, I can't say every house I've bought I've been able to wholesale or get rid of. Um, and I'm willing to take, you know, a small loss here or there, two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 if I can still just move it in, you know, that week time frame. But, you know, if that doesn't happen, and, you know, like I said, I'm not perfect, then I'll go through the retail model, get it paint carpeted, and stick it on MLS. And how, how often did, does that happen? I mean, like um, you have to do a percentage of time. If I had, to, I bet you I, I wholesale nine out of ten. Okay. 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 That's good. That's good to know. Um, and let me see here. And so, your your marketing funnel is you trying to get everybody to your website as much as possible. Have them, you know, enter the email, subscribe to to your mailing list, so that way you can just email it to them. Do right. you, do, um, do you, other than emailing them properties, do you build relationship with them in any other way? Do you? Uh, yeah. um, Once again, to your funnel. Most of my regular guys that are buyers, um, <laughs> I'd say a lot of my regulars buy most of my stuff. Um, I do have the the new guys that are that I try to you know especially the new guys that are trying to get in the market you know mm -hmm. I try to build relationships with them um, so you know because you got to once they get you know a taste of it and they get two or three under the belt they're just become going to become one of the regulars so you know I I do what I can to um, um, you know help new guys get started but really my goal is when I send that email out. Because I'm able to turn them so fast, it's almost kind of like a frenzy. So gotcha. um, you don't want to you don't want to lose the frenzy because like you have ten calls in two hours. Is it available? Is it available? And they're all headed out there to take a look at it, and uh, you know then it, um, you got you know with my local guys they can, they they know me long enough. They can say, hey Chris, I'll take that one, and that's it. But the deal's done. It's sold. No gotcha. contract, no earnest deposit. If you're one of my regular buyers, it's sold. So what is the percentage of buyers uh, do you have that is your regular buyers or your repeat buyers versus the percentage of new ones? I'd say, you know, my regular guys probably buy 75% of them. And then the new guy will pick up, you know, the newer one. But it's a wow. – it's a first come, first serve. If you're a new guy and you say, hey, Chris, I'll take it, um, you know, if you're a new guy that I haven't done before, I'm like, hey, all right, I'll give you till the end of business day to get a $3,000 non-refundable down to the office. They'll get you a contract. You can sign it. Um, but if you're one of the guys that have bought me, bought for me from a while, literally sometimes I'll just get a text, Chris, I'm taking this house. I reply, okay, deal's done. I mean, they, they go to my office. They, they know my assistant. They know what the contract looks like, you know. Right. Okay. And let me see. Yeah. Um, your, I mean, your, your buyers. Is there a specific profit margin that they're looking for? A, a specific percentage of the, you know, of the as is value that uh, they want to buy at, or each buyers are different. Well, it all depends on how much rehab is. It has. I mean, if it's, uh, um, for instance, I just sold one that's, you know, probably worth 100 that I just sold for 52, which is a 48% spread, but you're going to stake 17 in it. So, um, 
whereas I can sell something that's newer model stucco tile that's worth a hundred for probably you know seventy four. Gotcha. Okay. But that means my acquisition prices are way different. You know, the stucco tile is really clean. People are going to bid hard. Um, the one that needs 17000 people aren't going to bid so hard because very few people want to get involved with uh, electrical and plumbing and all that other fun stuff. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, let me see. Now, what, what you, uh, for for your buyers who who buy and hold, do you provide any type of property management uh, service to them, or do you refer them to a, ma- a property management company? Yeah, I, I just refer it out. A property management is not something I want to get involved in. Um, I when I had uh, you know in '05 before I liquidated all mine, I had. 19 houses to uh, manage, and uh, I think that taught me that I don't want to manage properties. <laughs> right. It's a. Uh, it's it's definitely a different. Um, uh, you know, you're dealing with a different type of people than when you're out there doing deals, uh, and um, yeah, for, for for sure when it comes to managing properties, and. And so, what about out of town buyers? Uh, I, you know, I know. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I was talking to to Bruce, who's also in your area. He's looking now into Canadian buyers and 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 you know, at, at finding those buyers to sell his houses to. Are you seeing a lot of out of out of area buyers, out of the country buyers for your business? Yeah, I'd say um, you know a big. Buying base for us, um, it's, you know, not here local, is California. And then there are a ton of Canadians in this uh, that are coming down to acquire in this area. And I've, uh, I've, I've sold to, you know, Canadians, but typically, like I said, they tap to the ro- local real estate market. So it's really, um, you know, my Canadian buying list is based on, you know, what agent they get a hold of, um, you know. I did. I bought ten for one one particular Canadian that came through this one agent, and they said, "Here's the model. Here's what we want to buy." And I just kept feeding them to the agent, and they kept buying them, and you know, until they were tapped out. But typically, the Canadians seem to find a local agent, and once again, working that agent relationship seems to bring them to me. Gotcha. Okay. Well, if I have, like, you know, I, I have students who, who live in Canada. Uh, if if they have a bunch of um, buyers, investor buyers who are interested in buying in the Phoenix area, are you open to working with, uh, you know, with, let's say, with one of my students in Canada uh, to, um, to to sell houses to his buyers and then pay him a, a, a cut of the uh, – of the profit or anything? Yeah, of course. I'm I'm always looking for new people that want to, you know, help develop uh, some kind of system in the business, whether it's, you know, just bringing buyers or um, – but, yeah, there's, there's always, you know, some way it can be worked out. You just got to sit down and – I like to just get it sit down and worked out on paper so everybody expands, understands everybody's expectations before we get the first house built so we're not trying to do that after the fact. Right, right, got it. <laughs> okay, and um, let me see here. Um, John, do you have any other questions on the uh, on finding the buyer part? Um, I think I, I think Chris covered uh, pretty much anything well. <laughs> that that we would look to do. There is uh, you try to drive people to your website. It is I think one of the biggest most important things, but do you, do you, do you do any kind of direct marketing for buyers these days? Uh, no, just, uh, like I said, the local, I just stick with the local title companies and real estate offices, teaching classes, doing luncheons. Um, I do ha- sponsor happy hours for the agents. Um, but whatever it takes to get, you know, mixed in those networks. Um, right. because so you've been, for every, you- 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and, go ahead and finish that. Sorry. <laughs> um, for every every one of those contacts I make, they're going to tell a friend, and they're going to tell a friend. I mean, it could be a month down the road, and they could be having a dinner conversation with an investor who's thinking about getting involved, and they're going to say, oh, I met this guy, Chris, you know, a month ago at this happy hour. So I just try to keep myself out there um, in the social networking and, you know, in the real estate offices and the title company because that's where they're going to go. Right. Sure. So you're really big on on networking, um, meeting with people, building relationships. I mean, it seems like that's like that's the primary thing that drives your whole business. Yeah, because it, it, I think it's a relationship business. It's, uh, I mean, um, like I said, if they're comfortable with you or they, or they're getting referral from someone who's done business with you, because unfortunately the foreclosure step guys have always had a bad rap. I mean, they're sharks, they're bad guys, they're crooks. You know, they're just. Um, but if you get enough people to know you, and that's why I do the classes, because you bring 50 people in, and you give them like a, I teach about a an hour and a half class, but it is like the nuts and bolts of foreclosure 101. You don't leave there going, well, how does this work or how does that work? Because I, I tell you exactly how the foreclosure process works in the state and exactly how you can buy it, buy it trustee sale. I'm also just trying to give you enough information to scare you a little bit because if you buy a second lien position or you buy something with uh, you know, a title that you didn't understand, you know, you can make a lot of money, but you can lose a lot of money real fast, too. So you just try to build that rapport with them or that comfort level with them, bring in 50 people, teach them, and then hopefully they just spread the word and, you know, get the next class up to bring the next 50 people in. Right, right, that's good. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, of course you make it sound obvious and extremely easy to work with you and buy from you versus you know, doing all of the like work, the hard work themselves, and and take the risk of buying at the auction. Yeah, I, what I do is I, uh, it's kind of it's kind of like most people want title insurance. Um, you know, when they buy a property, they want to make sure that everything's easy and clean. And and uh, I kind of I try to spin off that, going, why not use someone like myself who's been down there you know, for 11 years in a row and use my expertise, it's kind of like buying title insurance. You know, I mean, mm. I've done it long enough to know that I'm not going to make a mistake. And the difference is I'm not perfect. I've made a couple mistakes in the past, but I've also written the checks when I made the mistake. Um, so if a mistake was made and oops, this, uh, there was, you know, say $30,000 on this apartment building in max taxes and it got missed, I wrote the check. So um, there's just a comfort level knowing, especially if you're going to buy you know, 10 of these. I mean, you don't want to make a $60,000 mistake because uh, your, your price per home is going to go way up. Right. Well, that's good. The, the, so they do kind of have that insurance from you. <laughs> yeah. It, like I said, I've, I've made mistakes a couple times over 11 years. I'm not perfect, but – when the mistake was made, I was also willing to correct the mistake. So, right. Um, That's cool. Yeah, that 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 makes uh, perfect sense. Why they should be working with you for sure. Now let's move to the closing part of the deal. It sounds like you know almost all of your deals, or maybe all of your deals, you close them with your own money, and then turning around closing them with uh, uh, you know. With your buyers, and the and and that's how you get your money back, even if it's the next day. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. So there's there's no time when you just, you know, maybe you ha you use the buyer's fund to close on your first your your transaction, or you do an assignment to the buyer. Uh, very few. I just don't want my buyer to go to title because I mean they have to sign a piece of paper at title that says. Um, you're the buyer, you realize you're using your money to cr close Chris's deals. I have a large enough company that I want, I don't want them to go, well, why am I using my money to close Chris's deals? I'd just rather close it with my money. So, um, you know, because I kind of, kind of, you know, want to look like
like I'm one of the bigger players in town, which, you know, gotcha. I consider myself that I am, and I don't want them to go, Chris has his own money. Why am I, why am I using mine? I see. That makes sense. Okay. Um, are you, I mean, I know you, you, you said you're one of the biggest players. Are you the biggest? I mean, it sounds like you are. I can't imagine anyone bigger doing that many deals. No, there's there's two or three other companies that have been um, in this business um, as long as I have, and you know one of them who is my ex partner in the finance company. But there's there's a, I mean, in '99 it wasn't like there was any nobody at Courthouse Steps. There were three or four of us down there, and you know the three or four of us have built these companies, and um, they're probably doing similar volumes as I am. Gotcha. Okay. Good to know. Um, and when 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 you use your contracts and stuff, do you, um, do you use a state specific contract, or is it something that you you had it drafted uh, for your own internal company? Or? Yeah, I use a like a three page short form contract that has that doesn't have all the inspection periods and easy way out for the contract. It's more you know, you're buying it as is. Um, I've never lived in the property. You're paying cash, no financing, or you're using hard money financing. I uh, use kind of a simpler contract that I've put together. Gotcha. So, so you don't give your buyers a an inspection period. You expect you want them to look at it first before they decide to buy your house. Is that correct? Yeah, they're buying. They know that they're buying it as is, just like I am. They know that you know my markup is generally not that big. I mean, if you look at the fact that I'll take down an eighty thousand dollar house and sell it for eighty four, you know, a three percent commission on an eighty thousand dollar house is, you know, twenty four hundred bucks. I mean, right. I'm not making much more than that for actually writing a check for it and selling it. Right. That's true. Okay. And and um and, and then so you close everything as a title company, is that correct? Uh no. Um, I give people the option to go through title um, and through the title companies, um, but the title fees are at their expense. But I have a lot of my regular guys who have known me long enough that know that I give them a copy of the trustee's deed. I give them a quick, well, I give them a copy of the trustee's receipt that I bought it, and I give them a quick claim deed, and the transaction's done the next day. Okay, so in that case, they're not they're not buying title insurance. They're willing to take that risk. Correct. They just know that I've, you know, once again, um, I wouldn't still be in the business if I was out there creating quick claim deeds on houses that have lien issues and stuff like that. Right. Um, so, um, and I've been in the business a long time. They just trust me, and they know that hey, Chris bought this at, you know, at the trustee sale, and our our statutes are pretty, just like most states are. The statute of a trustee's deed wipes out most liens, um, except the IRS and property taxes, so on and so forth. Right, right. Okay. And who shows up for closing? Do you show up for it? Like when, when there's a closing at the title company, do you show up to closing or one of your team members showed up? No. no um, most of the people that are buying from us have met us. Um, if we show up for a closing, I tell the title company to email us over the docs. We sign them, courier them back. We don't show up to our customers' closings. Gotcha. Okay. And do you have somebody in your team that that manages all of the like sort of doing the closing coordinator, coordination, you know, getting the right documents from the right people and everything? Yeah, one of, uh, one of our assistants takes care of all that. Gotcha. Okay. And how long, you know, how long is a tip? How long does a typical deal take? From the beginning, when you you know, buy the property to to the end, when you get paid on it, and you know it's on to your buyers. Um, you know it's all it all varies. You know if I bought it short sale or REO, like I said, I'd probably have it sold before I even close on it. So the day I close on it, I'm probably closing it to my buyer the same day or next day. If it's a trustee sale, um, by statute. They are supposed to have us deeds in 10 business days. Well, the trustees are so backed up with the volume they're doing. We can have deeds as early as like seven days, and we can be chasing them 35 days later. Oh, wow. Okay. 
So, so when you don't have a deed, you can't sell the property yet. Is that correct? You're waiting right. until you get the deed and then see. Okay. Got it. Um, but in the meantime, while you're waiting for that, do you get a buyer to go ahead and commit to it and let them know that, hey, we're just waiting on the deed and the deal be done? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Um, all right. Um, and, and yeah, and so let, let's move on to um, – you know, sort of like pretending here. If you were if you were a newbie all over again, and um, you know, and and you're you're starting all over. You don't have all of these, you know, private money and and all of these access, all of these relationships that you have built. Uh, if you are a newbie again, and you want to, uh, you know, you want to get into this business that you're currently in. Um, what would your what would your thirty day action plan look like? What would you do the first week, and what would you do the second week, and so on? Um, you know, I would I would get to know or get to figure out what market I was I was working on. Am I going to buy and am I going to retail, or am I going to buy and become a wholesaler? Um, am I going to try to create my own bid service? I'd define that first. If I'm going to okay. buy and be if I'm going to buy and become a retailer, then I'm going to figure out where am I going to buy. Am I going to buy off the MLS? Am I going to break the courthouse? Um, so let's yeah. assume that let's assume that you're going to buy and you're going to wholesale. Okay. Um, I would just um, start working network. I mean, you know, meet, go find a guy like myself. Go find somebody that will give you time that's been doing it for 10 years um, and create that relationship first. Okay. Then, because um, that's how I started. I didn't stroll down to the courthouse first day with my money and start bidding. I start, I tried to figure out who were the players. Um, once, you, once you figured that out, then, you know, social networking, talk up, Talk up the business. Talk it up to your friends. Talk it up to the new people you meet. Talk it up. Go to the investor club meetings. Find the new guy that wants to get involved in it. Or, you know, try to create some kind of momentum through social networking. Um, all it takes is to find one good client that wants to buy houses and have the connection to the guy at the courthouse and, you know, start having him acquire property for you or, and and be the middleman for a little bit. Ah, that's okay. That's good. I like that. That's definitely a great idea. Okay. And then once you create enough volume, I mean, because you don't want to, I mean, to put the, the work to get down to the courthouse is a lot of work. I mean, it, it's not just, they just don't hand that list when you get down to the courthouse and says, here's the houses that are going to sale today. Um, it requires a lot of due diligence a good network with a title company to get your title searches done. Um, so I would just – I'd try to establish a relationship with a guy at a courthouse and go find a buyer and then go find the next buyer and go find the next buyer um, and create that middleman relationship. And then once you get enough volume, you know, you can maybe head down to the courthouse yourself or maybe you're just happy being the middleman um, or, you know, you can start looking on MLS and acquiring – you know, stuff off MLS forum. Um, but that's just what I would do. I I got everywhere just by meeting new people, social networking, getting new clients. Okay. All right. So so okay, so um so that's how you would do to find the the properties, the deals. Now how would you you know, let's say in, in week number two you want to build relationship and find buyers. What would the steps be that you would take? to find the buyer so you can connect the two of them together? Um, like I said, I would hit the, uh, I would try to find, I would hit the, the um, investor clubs, see if you mm-hmm. can meet anybody that's new there. Um, I would find out if anybody in your family network or anything like that was interested in trying to fix and flip. Um, I would just continue, you know, talking about it. Um, that's what, you know, that's what I did is just, you know, mine started from friends and family and, uh, you know, I was able to acquire some of these houses and, but I also had an example. I, I showed that I bought one and I picked it up and I sold it and, uh, I had a couple of examples. So 
you know, definitely doing doing a couple and getting them under your belt, saying, hey, look at these two deals that I just did. You want to get involved in this? That definitely helps. Gotcha. Okay. That's yeah. That's definitely a great uh, great tip. And then and then so you know, let's say week three, you want to take that to the next level, and you want to help your buyers find some private money so they they get they have funding and stuff for these deals. How would you go about doing that? Most of the private private money guys will be at those investor club meetings. Um, I know there. Are, I actually used to be at the Houston meeting and the Dallas meeting when I had my $80 million out on the street. I was loaning in Texas, and, and I know that I had a guy there on every investor club, like the Houston Investor Club. I had a table at every one of those meetings. Oh wow! So you were lending outside of your your market area. Yeah, we were lending in Nevada, Texas, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona. What, what, were, was, were, the, what was the name of the company at that time? Finance Group. I got a hard money loan from you guys. <laughs> about that? That's me. Yeah. That's Crawling awesome. back out wow. of the hole. <laughs> yeah, and I got my hard money loan from you in 2007. <laughs> yeah. Well. But your, well, your hard money lending business didn't get affected in other states, though, or not as bad as what happened in Phoenix. No, though, right? not near as bad as what happened in Arizona. No. Um, most, of, like I said, the Houston market uh, didn't. The Houston market didn't go down. But don't right. go back to Active Finance Group. That's one of my partners. Come back to Chris Hine and that's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 after what happened, you and your partner broke up, and now he's sort of like your competitor now. Is that correct? Well, he's in the hard money business. He's still he's still in the hard money business. I'm, you know, I'm back into uh, the hybrid business. The reason I like the hybrid business is you're acquiring houses through the bid service and the wholesale service. Well, those generate the need for the hard money, as opposed to just being a hard money lender. It's waiting for customers to come in. My gotcha. my acquisition and my sales creates my financing. Got it. Okay, that makes makes a lot of sense. And okay, and so so um, I mean, so you would not try to find private money outside of the normal real estate um, um, groups, so that way you get better interest rate because you know people are, are getting very little for their CDs and stuff. So if you go after the people who have CDs, you could probably get loans for six, eight percent. Um, yeah, no, there's a, there's probably some people that advertise in local magazine, our local you know trade magazines or local uh, newspaper or Craigslist. I would definitely look at those. When I first got started, when I was buying in 2000, 2001, I found where you know we were an 18 percent lender. I was able to find a 14% lender that was just some local guy that was, you know, perfectly happy taking the 14. Um, and uh, I mean, he had two million dollars that I was using before I, you know, got into the. That's before I really got into the hard money business, which is more like 2003 when I got in the hard money business. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. And then so. So. Um, so, like, what are you going to do? So, we're going back to you being a newbie again. So, what are you going to do to continue and to ensure that you have this marketing machine uh, going, keep on finding more deals, finding more buyers, finding more money? What would you, what would you uh, make sure that you do every single day? You know, what would you do every single day when you wake up? Um, you know, uh, like I said, it's it's tough. Or, or tougher, it depends on which market you're in. Here locally, there's trusty sales every single day. So you can go try to find another new deal to sell or another new deal to put in front of people every single day. Um, unfortunately, when you're in the Houston market, um, you, your trusty sales are once a month. So right. I, would def- I would definitely try to get, um, get your real I mean, if you don't have your real estate license, get your real estate license. So maybe you could see sit there and look at the hot sheets of all the the REOs that come out every day or something like that, but just something to get them to remind you every day. Like, even if I buy five properties today, I won't send all five of them out today. I'll send out one or two to the next consecutive days. I just, 
I'd like to send that one email today. Just a reminder, you know, Chris is still here. Chris is still buying properties. You know, you don't want to you don't want to go away for two weeks. People freak, start to forget about you. Hmm. Okay. Got it. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a uh, you know that that's a that's a great um, thirty day uh, uh, plan for sure. And you know, and 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 with that, you know, you know, with that, because um, a, a lot of people listening to this interview are newbie investors. What advice or wisdom um, would, you know, can you share with them in getting started in this business? Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It just you just got to keep plugging away at it, keep plugging away at it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it, you know, it doesn't develop overnight. You just got to keep going. And if you're the newbie investor and you don't, I mean, you're looking for an income. When I was uh, when I started first doing my first fix and flips that I talked about in 99, you know, I didn't, I didn't quit my job until four months later. So I knew that I was going to have enough wholesale business coming from what I was acquiring to wholesale off to my friends that said, hey, you know, I have an income now. Gotcha. Okay. That's awesome. And, and, and like when, when you, um, you know, what, what happened in 2007, uh, you will, you know, you, I mean, you end up losing a lot of money. What, what did you do to, to start the process of getting, you know, get, getting back on your feet? Um, I mean, was it just, was it just, you know, little things that you keep on doing and doing consistently to get you back? Or was there any like big thing that you, that you had to do? Like big projects. No, I, I just stopped. I just got rid of all the excess, um, the stuff that wasn't needed. Um, you know, I went back to driving an older car. I went back to getting rid of credit cards, not, you know, buying any extras, not, uh, you know, I got back to the fundamentals and I haven't left the fundamentals. My current only debt right now is my house payment. I don't write a check for my car every month. I don't write a check to credit cards every month. I have to pay my house payment, and that's it. Gotcha. Okay, and and that's a really good tip because I, I you know, it's probably would be the same tip I would advise to people who um, perhaps just got laid off or or they want to get out of their job as soon as possible. The first thing to do is to simplify your life for sure, <laughs> right? Because when I was back yeah, in the when I was back in the fun days before. It, got ugly. I mean, I look back, I needed somewhere around $20,000 a month to pay all my bills. And that's, I mean, that's just crazy. I need about $3,000 a month to pay all my bills now. And uh, (laughs) now all of a sudden when you're making money and you just got to put in, you know, 3,000 bucks a month, you're like, oh, what do I do with this extra money? (laughs) Gotcha. Okay, and uh, so so you have simplified your life quite a bit. Then I mean, dropping from twenty thousand a month to three thousand a month. Yeah, and you know, you know, when you're uh, when you went when you've been through some tough times, you you appreciate um, the ability to have some money in the bank and you know be able to go to a nice dinner because um, there were some times where that was not an option. Gotcha. Um, are you are you married or are you single or what's up? <laughs> I'm single, um, but I have three kids. Um, I have uh, I have a freshman in high school that plays on the football team. I have a seventh grade daughter that plays on the volleyball team, and I have a, a fourth grade daughter. So I mean, they keep me busy. Gotcha. Are you training them to be investors as well? Um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, I think I'll teach them all about the real estate business um, <laughs> as much as they want to learn. Um, but I'm not going to – I am not. I mean, I want them to pursue something that makes them happy. Like I said, I can do this seven days a week from sunup to sundown. I don't consider it a job. Um, you know, it's just it's fun for me. And teaching a new guy to learn how to do it, you know, it's fun for me. If he buys a house and puts it and sells it and makes money and calls me back and says, hey, Chris, that was great. That's not what I look for. 
Um, gotcha. And I could I could make a lot more money if I, uh, but I want my customers to make money. Um, that's why you know I I do the four thousand or five thousand dollars per house. I hope they make twenty thousand dollars per house um, because if they make money, they're going to tell their friends, or are going to tell their friends, or are going to tell their friends. Right. Right. Okay. And how many hours are you working a day or a week uh, now in your business? I probably work 60-ish. 60 hours a week? Wow. <laughs> are you a workaholic? Uh, I don't know. I Like I said, I, I love the business. My phone's on at 7 in the morning. I sometimes, sometimes take calls at 8 o'clock at night. Unless I'm, like, at a kid's sporting event, I answer my phone. So what time does your day normally start, like, in terms of, like, working in the business? Uh, my phone will start ringing around 7, 7.30. Okay, so that's sort of when your day starts then for work. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So you, you, you're not the one who's doing the, the research and stuff early in the morning to find out which properties you're going to bid on and stuff. Do you have someone else doing that? Yeah, I'm, that's not part of my job. My, Like I said, I just arrange the hard money, meet customers, um, take calls. I mean, I still have – some of the customers that have been my customers for a long time still like to call call the business into me. So, you know, I, I take in the information and just relay it. Gotcha. Okay, that's awesome. Um John, do you have any um do you have any other questions for, for Chris? Uh you know what? Anything that I've I've thought of along the way, um <laughs> Chris has actually answered in another in another question. So uh you've done great. That's awesome. Okay. Well, uh, Chris, I want to thank you so much, buddy, for, for you know, your willingness to be on this interview and, uh, and share a wealth of information with all of us. And I know a lot of these things are proprietary to you, but, yeah, you were very open and, and, and very willing to share. That's probably your secret to success, huh, your, your openness. Yeah, like I said, once if you can get guys to trust you in the business, and like I said, when I teach the classes, I'm, I'm op- I tell it exactly how it is. Um, now granted, I guess I could cr- be educating my competitor, but generally most people can't. I mean, you just can't start doing the volume that I'm doing tomorrow. So, um, you know, you just once they get a trust with you, they'll bid through you or they'll buy from you or, you know. Right, right. Yeah, so which reminds me, um, how can they or where can they go to learn more about you and your business, perhaps become one of your buyers, perhaps become one of the people that will bring you buyers or become one of the private, um, you know, one of your private lenders? Where can they go? Well, they can just start by going to the website, which is uh, sellwholesalehouses.com. Um, okay, that's that's S E L L. Wholesalehouses.com, is that correct? Yep. Yep. And then, you know, if you hit the contact us, it says Chris Simon. That's my cell phone number. That's the number I'm talking on right now. That's the phone that starts ringing at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. Um, and, like, I, I answer it from pretty much 7 to 10. And then, uh, you know, you know, then they can just get on the phone with me. They can get on a call with me, and, you know, I can go, I can walk them through the steps in 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it takes to, you know, get them comfortable with, you know, the different processes that need to happen or that ha- that happen. Right. Oh, you know what? I just have an idea. Have you considered doing online, um, you know, either teleseminar or webinar type thing to train people on how to, you know, uh, how to become your, your how to become um, about the foreclosure process, kind of like the same class that you do at title companies, but doing it online for for all of the people who are opting into your list, so that way, you know, now you get to do it from the comfort of your own home, and you do it once, and you can sort of play that that same one over and over. Have you considered doing anything like that? I thought about putting, you know, you know, putting that together. Um, I just uh, I don't know how to market it or you know how to okay. get it out there past the current um, customers I have. I, I should probably be getting it up to Canadian customers, but I'm I just don't. Marketing is not one of my strong points. I gotcha, get all gotcha. my <laughs> I get all my customers from local guys, you know. 
Right. Okay. Well, well, you know, if you need any help uh, with that, let me know, and I'll I'll do what I can to help you. Because um, I mean, there, there's certain you know there, there are systems out there that uh, you know that you can set those things up pretty pretty easily. So that way, your your you know your buyers, your your potential customers, whether they're from Canada or they're from Europe somewhere. Uh, or from China, you know, you know, they can be watching these training videos um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to uh, you know, to educate themselves on it and become, you know, become a, a, a one of your buyers or one of your lenders. Right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And I hope that this interview too also brings you a lot of buyers and a lot of uh, lenders for your business as well. Um, and uh, yeah, with, with you know, with that, I want to thank you so much. I mean, uh, for you know, for everything, for for being the awesome guy that you are, um, and you know, and being so generous with your information and stuff. I really appreciate that. No problem. All right. Well, uh, I just want to say that incredible interview. That's just some of the things that uh, that we went through there. You know what? It, it's really a tribute. To, to show that it, it doesn't take the, you know, the most advanced software system out there, and uh, you know, it, it it goes to show that uh, relationships and and honesty in this business will will bring you a long way. So uh, so Chris, I would just really like to thank you so much for for being with us today, and and Tim for the great interview with the uh, great questions and. Uh, just want to say, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in, and I can't wait for our next one of these interviews. So, Chris and Tim, thanks again. Thank right. you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. Talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye.